I love your state. If you're from Utah, I love your state. I come here as I've been, I think, three years in a row. And uh, I just love the bow hunting opportunity for mule deer here, namely your Wasatch Front deer hunting. I love that opportunity. And today we're going to talk about a lot of bow hunting, the Wasatch Front, and basically bow hunting in general. But you're going to see a lot of pictures, and a lot of what we're talking about are right here in your backyard. Okay? But this information I'm going to give you today, you can take it to Idaho, if you're from Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, take it back to wherever it'll work because I've hunted, I lived in Colorado for 20 years, I hunted mule deer there, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, I've been all over the southwest United States and central Rockies hunting mule deer with a bow and arrow since 1995, that's my, I just love it. So uh, most of you, this is a, just old hat, it's like coming home for me to come here and see you guys. So. We're going to talk about mule deer hunting. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Mark Smith. Um, I have a uh, alias Muley Slayer. That is my on. Uh, I have a Facebook page, Instagram. I'm Muley Slayer One. I totally expect everybody when you leave here, go out like my Muley Slayer page on Facebook. Go to Muley Slayer One on Instagram. Follow me, and I'm always talking about something. One thing you, I can guarantee you, coming from me, it's legal. It's integrity. And I'm a bow hunter, so of course I'm a narcissist, so it's a lot about me, but that's just how bow hunters are. We talk about ourselves a lot. And look at me and look what I do. However, I'm a guy that's genuine, I'm real. The number one rule with me is keep it real, okay? If all you kill is fork and horns, say that. How many people in this room have killed a fork and horn two-point buck? So we're all, at least we all have something in common, right? So I, you, you, you do that, okay? You start off shooting those bucks, and then it leads into three pointers and you try to say I'm going to hold out for a four pointer. Hey, I'm not a score guy, okay? I'm a bow hunter. I love to put meat in my freezer every year. Uh, I love adventure. That's why I do a lot of backpack, you know, uh, public land style hunting. That's all that I do pretty much. But I'm not here today. I want to make sure that's clear. The number one rule in any of my seminars, we're going to keep it real. First 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. The next 30 minutes is I want to talk about what you want to talk about. I want you to ask me how I stay scent free. I want you to ask me how I hunt the wind. I want you to talk to me about thermals. I want you to talk to me about whatever it is you want to talk about. And if you know, if you, if I'm up here talking and I'm telling you something and you know for a fact you know, know more about that than me, I want you to be the guy to raise your hand and say, have you ever thought about this? Because I'm learning from you too, because you're the best, you guys are the best resource. The hunters that are coming to get better, you're here for a reason. You're here to get better. I'm here to help you get a little better, but I want to get better. So when I when you ask questions and we interact, feel free to tell me in a polite way that, hey, you know what? What you're saying is right, but guess what? Me and my brother have been doing it this way forever, then I'm gonna take some of your old family trips to the mountains next year too. So that's why I want to keep it. I want to keep it real. I don't put anybody down for anything they want to shoot with any type of weapon they want to shoot it with. If you want to shoot it with a crossbow, if you want to shoot it with a slingshot, a bow and arrow, a 270 Weatherby Magnum, which sometimes I do, I want you, that's okay. If you love killing spikes and two points, that's okay. It's your God-given right. If the law says, if the state says you can and you want to, you should. Today we're going to talk about if you decide you've killed enough fork and horns and you've killed enough three points, and you're like, hey, I want to challenge myself a little bit more. And you're a bow hunter. I'm going to talk about some things that you may want to know even if you're a gun hunter. Is there any gun hunters in here? Rifle hunters? Muzzle loader hunters? Yeah, me too. So some of this stuff, you just take it right with you. Right, in, right into uh, muzzle loader hunting and, and rifle hunting. And uh, you can use that. Maybe I'll use the steps. <laughs> I won't break my neck. So, <clears throat> but today, like I said, the seminar is going to be about, or this, our little meeting here is about hunting mature mule deer. First thing you need to know, and I see it all the time on social media, I'm a social media guy, man, I love Facebook, I love Instagram, I'm looking at it, and I don't know if it was just me, but this year there was a plethora of fellas posting animals on there that really need to understand what they're talking about. They were calling, they were, they were saying they shot deer in the this range when they were in the this range a lot. And a lot of that's because they were holding it like that. That's, what, that's the keeping it real part, right? Man, I love you, but don't send me a picture of your 180 inch buck and I can see your fingers like that. And you, come on now, that's not keeping it real. 
I think some people just don't know. I think they really just don't know what a mature deer is or what a mature deer is not, an immature deer. And why would you want to shoot an immature or a mature deer? Well, we're going to cover all that. So let me see what this thing will do here. <clears throat> Look at that thing right there. Look at that gnarly buck. How many people in this room would shoot that buck if they had a chance? <laughs> yeah, me too. You know who did? That guy right there. That's Jason Whitworth with Team Backcountry. Uh, that's a perfect example of a deer that needed to be shot, right? He's mature. He is, he, I would say he's ugly, but I think he's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. But he's awesome. He's mature. He's past mature. Look at the bases on that thing. Won't score for nothing, but he is an absolute giant deer. That's the, absolutely the kind of deer the state division of wildlife wants you to be shooting. He, he has no purpose in the gene pool. He has no purpose other than, and I'll promise you, by the time November, December hit, that was the buck breeding does. And it wasn't a 200 inch clean four point. That beat up, tore up, tore up ears, blind maybe in one eye, tore up, scarred up deer. He didn't get that way because he's a sissy. He got that way because that's just the way God made him. He's going to be that way. So he's an awesome buck. <clears throat> We're going to talk about here what and why is identifying mature deer, herd management, gene pool. So that's the conservationist in me coming out saying, hey, the state of Utah would want me to talk to you about gene pool in the state. I live in Texas now, okay? I don't live out west anymore, but I still come back every year hunting. And in Texas, if you want to manage a deer herd, it's all private land, okay? So te Texas has a bad rap because people don't understand Texas hunting. It's high fenced in corn feeders. Man, we can go on all day about corn feeders and all that, but here's, here's the deal, I live there. I hunt that way too. If you go lease up 10,000 acres and you want to manage the deer herd on it, but everybody around you does not want to do that, you're spinning your wheels. Even if you spent all this money on the land and you want to keep the deer the way you want them because it's not public land. You can't just go and fight other people to hunt them. Once you lease this property, you have a deed just like at your home or anything else you rent or lease, and it says you have the rights to hunting on that piece of ground. Well, the first thing they do is they put an eight foot fence around it. And then Texas is so thick, you'd never see a deer if you didn't have some kind of sendero right away or a feeding station for them to come into. So then they pop up a corn feeder and a protein feed and they start feeding deer and they put trail cameras up, just like you do on the front. The only thing is in Texas, if I've got a 150 inch white tail buck coming into a certain food plot that I want to shoot, I got a pretty good chance I'm going to shoot him and you're not because you don't have permission to be there. Dustin Whitworth is on the Wasatch Front. He's got a salt lake out and he's got a 180 inch buck coming in and hitting it. He can't say anything if you sit down 10 feet from that salt lake and kill it with a stick bow or a muzzle loader or whatever, right? I mean, it's just the way it's done. So in Texas, put your fence up, put your feed thing up and just watch the cameras and, and manage your herd. Shoot the mature deer that you want to shoot or even the big mule deer operations in Mexico. Do the same thing. They got high fence down in Mexico hunting gigantic 200 inch mule deer. Thousands and thousands of acres. I don't even think it's cheating if it's in a fence that's 10,000 acres. I, I've hunted on 10,000 acre places for hogs. I've never even saw a fence, right? So anyway, that's kind of my spill on it. It's not bad to do that. That's just the way it's done. But out here out west, where we hunt on public land, man, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. We're all fighting each other, right? So the guys that consistently kill bucks like this, that are managing the herd, they're going a little further, a little deeper, staying a little longer. And that's part, that, is the, that is the number one key to killing mature deer, is time. It is how much time can you spend and how willing are you to not shoot any deer other than that deer, okay? So the ch just cover that, the challenge and trophy quality. Who does not want that picture? That thing is so gnarly, it's so ugly, but man, going out, I just had to put that in there, man, because I think it's awesome. <laughs> Big old deer, you did good. Now, I'm picking on Jason here, and you're not supposed to call out people in the crowd, it makes them uncomfortable, but I do it to them every year. You put a lot of work into that though, didn't you? The equivalent of putting up the fence and the feed station and all that, except it was no feeding. It was public land and you just went in a little further than everybody else and you spent a little more time than anybody else and you reaped the reward pretty early in the hunt, right? First two hours. <laughs> How many hours up to 
The first two hours when you killed that deer, how many hours did you put in, do you think, leading up to that? At least one, one day every week. And then one trip we did 17 miles in one day. Yeah. It was a lot. And then people on, on social media want to hate on him like, uh, he's got lucky. Oh, yeah, I knew that buck. I, I knew where that buck was. I've seen that buck before. Man, nobody's seen that buck. That thing was so far in. Nobody's seen that buck. Anyway, it's awesome, man. I want to thank you for allowing me to share that with the crowd because that's the epitome of the deer that needs to get shot in Utah. So, your guy, you said, hey, I think that's cool, but other than big antlers, how am I going to know what a mature deer is? Two tails on this. This, this deer right here shows a bunch of characteristics of a mature deer. Belly. Number one is the distance between his Roman nose and his jaw right here. If this is an immature deer, there's a long skinny face right here. This right here, that, there should there would be a straight line from the from back where his gut goes into his hands right here, straight down to his brisket, there'd be a straight line. That is a 100% fully mature deer right there. Sway back, big old pot belly, kind of like Somebody else I know, <laughs> mature buck, yeah. I've been getting rid of my mature buck though lately. So, uh, and then you go into the, the, the amount of mass on a deer. That right there is a telltale sign. You're just not going to shoot an immature deer with a lot of mass. Some, some mass, you know, healthy deer will have some good mass, that four inch. But you get into this, you're looking four and a half, close to five inch uh, mass measurements on a deer like that. That's a great buck. You, would you have shot that buck open today if you'd have seen him? Yeah, me too. Here's an immature buck. That's a nice deer. How many people shoot that buck and be just totally happy with it? Yep. Sometimes me too. Sometimes me too. All that depends on the tag you get though, right? If you've been putting in for the Henry's and you finally got it after 17 years, you gonna shoot that deer? I don't even know if I have a deer on this presentation you'd shoot on the Henry's. You'd probably just eat the tag if you didn't kill the, the once in a while. But you know what? That's when, you, that's, when you, that's when you trophy hunt, when you have a tag like that, or if you've got a buck stake down. But if you're like, hey man, I'm gonna go hunt the Wasatch, I'm gonna go hunt unit 456 or 17A, 17B, down, down south a little bit, some of these general tags, but you've been killing fork and horns, you've been killing three points, and you're like, man, I, I just want to, I want that next level. Well, if this is your next level, good. But just know that's not a mature deer, that's not a breeder buck. That buck right there is not breeding does come November, December. There's always a bigger fish. That long skinny snout, that straight baseline right here, straight back, that's three year old deer. Three and a half year old deer. Look at that bad boy, that's mature deer. He don't have a sway back, but he's walking, but look at the depth of his neck. See that? That Roman nose, and this right here, man, that's, woohoo. Man, he probably wishes you'd shoot him. <laughs> that one for sure wishes you'd shoot him. He has some serious problems, man. And if you're a truly a manager, a manager of wildlife, and you just want to do the right thing, and you're a Boy Scout, you should let this buck walk on by. Because he's going to shoot that one. Yeah, not me. <laughs> me, I'm going to hammer that sucker. I'm going to put a broad head in him as soon as I can. Immature bucks. Again, this borderline. You look at that, and you're like, man, that's got a cheater. So, you know, one of the things I'm going to tell you today is you need to draw a line in your mind. What is you want? That's everything in your life. What do you want? What do I want? What do I want? I want to kill a deer with a cheater. I have never killed a deer with a, che a cheater buck. I've killed nice four points, and I've killed wide four points, and I've killed some really wide three points. I've never killed a deer with a cheater on it. Come opening day, first five minutes, or the last five minutes, 30 days into the season. No matter what, as soon as I see a buck with a cheater in line or something, I'm, that's the one I want. And you may in your mind think, man, I want a 200 incher with an inline cheater, right? But then you go out and you go hunt and you see this buck. And you go, well, man, old Mark said that thing ain't nothing but a baby. He's got a little skinny neck and a little long face and he ain't got no gut on him, but golly, he's got an inline cheater. That's what you wanted. Have it in your mind, hey, he looked good, man. I've been wanting that. I was blinded by it because I saw this little extra point right here and I shot him. And, it, and, and you have this remorse, right? Buyer's remorse. You walk up, ground shrinkage. Ah, oh, ah, oh, man. 
and you do everything you can for 30 minutes to make it look big in your camera. You take pictures, you keep setting further and further back, and your buddy's like, no, use your left arm, no, your other arm, no, pull. Now hold that left antler this way. Is that good? It's good, man, I got it. You got your big buck, right? But inside, you know, because you're not keeping it real, like, yeah, it wasn't a big buck. But, it's, but you had it in your mind, hey, I want to shoot a cheater buck. I want to shoot a deer that's got a cheater on it. All right, they call that an inline cheater, and then you have the hook trash, whatever. Point is, Draw lines in your mind, what's acceptable, what you're willing to say, hey, absolutely, no matter what, this is what I'm going to shoot. If you see it, you like it, shoot it. If you don't, pass it. Pass it up. Wait for mature deer. 99% of the people on social media are going to jump on there and shoot this deer and they're going to tell everybody they shot a mature buck. I know a lot of people say it's a 190 inch deer. <laughs> that deer right there probably needs to be shot. He's a mature, skinny neck, long face. Real, no, no broad, no width to his shoulders whatsoever. Cool deer though. And be honest, honestly, this is the same age class I killed on the Wasatch two years ago. Anybody remember that buck I killed had the big U-horn on it? Crazy thing, man. I'd been in, I'd, I'd been with these guys in the Ruby Mountains of Nevada for a week. I come home and I go up in Utah. Started off in one spot, that didn't work out too good. Went to another spot, hunted, saw some great bucks. And then one morning out popped this U-horn buck. He's a four point on one side, little three year old buck. Had this U-shaped antler on the other side with a big crab claw tooth thing on it. And I was like, shooting that, it's unique. I even had, I had it mounted. Grandpa mounted it for me. That thing's terrible. <laughs> the mount's good, the deer's ugly. I mean, it's terrible. You walk in and you just want to look at it, right? But it's so unique, you gotta have it, man. If I ever have a beer joint in Lukenbach, Texas, that thing's going above the bar. <laughs> so, that's, Here's another one. Who'd shoot that buck? This is the old three point. Three point on that side. No, don't even have a brow time. Would you shot that deer opening day? I would. Everywhere, any day, everywhere that I have a bow tag, I shoot him. He's mature. That's 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 what I want. I personally, Martin Smith, I want to shoot a mature deer. I don't want. I want to shoot a 200 inch in my life. Okay, the biggest buck I've ever killed ever was 192, and I shot it with a gun, 186 with a bow and arrow. I want to kill, if I'm like at Burger King, having it my way, I want 32 wide, 4x4, four four, inline cheaters, extras on the outside of the G4s. That's what I want. Probably never going to happen, but man, I'm going to keep going until I do. But I'd already have it in my mind. I don't have any type of score or antler configuration in my mind when I go deer hunting. Unless I've already clearly seen the deer, I've scouted it, got pictures of it, or my friends have some pictures of it, and I'm scavenging off of them like I normally do. I would say, hey, if I see a mature deer, I'm gonna whack it. That's what I want. That is a mature deer. Sometimes you just gotta shoot them, whether they're mature or not. And that's this one right here. This is a buck I scouted in 2009. How many of you guys would shoot that deer? Oh, don't just flatter me. <laughs> I shot him. My friends kept telling me about him. They had trail camera pictures of him. He, they named him Wide Low. Their little nephew named him Wide Low. I think I've seen five bucks on the internet since then named Wide Low, but I was the first one. <laughs> so this buck right here, everybody in camp, 30 inch buck guaranteed, no doubt about it. I was like, I don't think so. I don't think he's 30 inches wide. Yeah, he's 30. You ought to see him going away. He's huge. All right. <laughs> Two of my buddies, one of my buddies skipped an arrow off of his back. Another guy got Elvis leg. You know what Elvis leg is? <laughs> missed him with Elvis leg. Good old Leroy Dunger, I love that guy. He missed him. I got there, and they're like, man, this buck is notorious for just getting away. You can, he just gets away. He just continues to get away from us no matter what. He's living a charmed life. I was like, hmm, see what I can do about that for you. So I found him, and he was in an oak brush thicket. Sure enough, man, I'd seen him, I'd range him, put my range finder down, come to full draw, he'd walk out of my peep. I'd hike down the trail a little ways, no brush, and here he'd come again, range him, put it down, draw back, he'd walk out of my peep. I've only done that two times in a row. I ain't doing that again. Next time I see him, I'm shooting. So he'd come out, kept walking down the ridge, he'd come out of the oak brush again. When he did, I drew back, and I, and I was ready this time, and I went, mm, 54 yards, boom, pow, 55 yards. I just had to do it. It just took being aggressive to get him killed. But I wanted to use this as an illustration that I shot this deer. It's not a mature deer. He's like three and a half year old. I mean, he'd have been a giant. 
Wasn't a lot of bugs in this unit that year. This was actually down in the Four Corners area on the Arizona side of the Navajo Indian Reservation. It's a general tag, $400 tag. But uh, anyway, again, not a mature deer, looked good, and uh, he put on quite a bit from, I think that you can see right here, that was August 6th. He was growing pretty good, and I shot him like mid-September. He'd already gone hard antler. How old was he? 29. 29, as far as I can stretch it on the outside of the G3s. <laughs> yeah, it's keys to success. Objective, what's your objective? All right, we talked about that. We talked about what kind of buck do you want to shoot. Opportunity, opportunity is don't go into a unit with thinking, hey man, I'm, no matter what this year, I'm holding out for a 200 inch deer, I'm holding out for 190 inch deer, no matter what. Is, is Wasatch where, offering that? Or? Where? What, we, what, if you, unless you've seen them, how do you know they got that? That's a big size. Are you, are you a bow hunter? I'm, I'm from California. Oh. I'm going to let some of the locals talk to you about the Wasatch. I wouldn't feel comfortable, sir, talking to you about it. <laughs> yeah, there's some monsters up there. Great bow hunting opportunity. Um, that opportunity is one of the, it's the best. And you know what the state did? It. The state sec sectioned off units a couple years ago. And that's been like seven years now, right? Six years ago. State sectioned it off and put boundaries on general units, really limited it. The reason it's so awesome is bow only. You have to be so many miles back in before you can gun hunt some of that, right? Or some of it's off limits to gun hunting, correct? Rifle hunting, gun hunting sounds so anti-gun. Rifle hunting, man, we rifle hunt, muzzle loader hunting, but no, bow hunting uh, is mainly that whole Wasatch front, it's a bow hunting opportunity only, and it goes clear into November. That's another reason you have so many giant deer up there, right? You're not, you're not rough. You get a 10 day season, right? Say you live in Utah. Well, you live in Colorado is different, right? They give you like a month. Some states would give you a little less, some states give you a little more. But if you don't have much time, if you don't have very much time, you're forced to shoot something. Maybe you didn't, really didn't want to, but the number one reason we hunt is me. That's it. It should be. If it's not, <coughs> reevaluate why you hunt. But for me, it's, that is why. I like the meat, I eat it. And if you don't eat it, you're providing it to somebody else, that's just as good. But if you're only hunting for a trophy aspect, I mean, that's cool, that's your deal. I'm not going to judge you, but that's not what I think hunting is about. So, anyway, shoot, if you don't have much time, you're going to go out and you're going to fill your freezer. That's what you're going to do. But what's great about this opportunity on the Wasatch Front is you got all from August, middle of August, middle of September, then the next day they call it the extended and you go clear into end of November, isn't it? And that's when the bucks are swollen up and ruddy and hard though, man. I'm not, it's a tough hunt. I came out, I didn't get one. I came out one year, I saved my tag, came out in November, saw some great bucks. It was hard. Man, anybody kills one in the snow here. When I see those pictures, I just, tons of respect. The guy right there, Dave, killed a nice one a couple years ago. Real big, nice, heavy buck. So you need to be realistic about your opportunity, what kind of bucks you got in your area, how much time do you have. So I look for tags that give me multiple opportunity. Arizona is a great area. You're not going to kill a huge deer for the most part, like in some of Arizona. If you're from California, that northwest Arizona has got some great deer hunting. And you can hunt August, then you go back in December. If you buy it in January, hunt January, then you go back, you go back. You can get three hunts out of it. Uh, yeah. So if I lived in California, I would, I would, Arizona would be probably one of my prime, my very next go-to state out of California. I'd go to Arizona. <clears throat> the main thing are these two things right here. Commitment and something else. As far as your keys to success, and we'll get into that. You know what, we can go past that. This is the generic stuff I always talk about, and y'all can ask me about that in the thing, because I want to make sure you guys all have the time you need. Hunting pressure, lack of game, weather, loneliness, loss of focus. Remember why you started. That right there, right there, remember why you started. Commitment. Always let your commitment to your hunt be greater than why we fail. There's so many reasons why, why you fail, and these are the reasons. You get lonely. I'm going to tell you a hunting story, okay? I'm going to tell you a full-blown front-to-back hunting story. And it's about my hunt on the Wasatch this year here in Utah. I came up here with the intention of hunting a week. And then I was going to leave and go to Idaho with Corey 
for a week. We were going to hunt deer and elk. I wanted to hunt the over-the-counter Idaho opportunity. I wanted to go learn something new in a new state and bring it back to you and tell you something I know, something I learned. I learned a lot, but I didn't go to Idaho to learn it. So at the end of this deal, or after the next few slides, I'm going to go into this story. It took me 15 days. What turned out to be what I planned to be, a seven-day hunt, and then there was an attack on another seven days, go to Idaho, then go back to Texas. I something happened inside me and I said, I'm not leaving this mountain until I kill a deer. And I'm not gonna kill a little buck. I'm gonna kill a mature buck. And I was hunting a unit that's probably not a very good unit. I mean, not really for bow hunting, not compared to the other units that I've hunted here. And um, it took me 15 days. And on the 15th day, I killed the one I wanted. And it was really tough. Uh, and in that story, I'm gonna tell you about hunting pressure, lack of game, Weather well, wasn't a real issue this year here in the Wasatch, but you know what? That's one of the reasons right there we fail. Soon you can have all the aspirations in the world to kill a giant buck, but as soon as your feet get wet, you're miserable, your down sleeping bag gets wet, and you're going home, right? Loss of focus, you know, we've talked about that in my seminars before. You lose your focus because something happened at home right before you left, and you're guilty, you're feeling guilty about it. You didn't. You know, you didn't do this or that before you left, so you lose your focus because you're thinking about something other than the task at hand. That's getting a deer on the ground. And then you got to remember why you started. It's a long, one of my favorite things I say all the time, especially on social media, it's a long time between Augusts. Man, you can, you can have all the dreams in the world and you come out in the hunt, then you start missing your wife's cooking, you miss your kids, and you start missing all these things, and you're like, man, there's always next year. And you pack up your truck and you go back home. Man, from the instant you pull out of the trailhead, you're immediately regretting it, but you're already committed to go home. It's a long time from there until next August. Remember that, it's painful. And then as soon as you get home, guess what? Your social media is blown up because this guy got his buck, and that guy got his buck, and that guy got his buck. Matt Howell absolutely got his buck, and it's like, <sighs> stayed on the mountain. I came home because I missed, I missed my wife. And then, you know, you're being a you know what, so you get in a fight with her anyway. And you and her both are wishing you were back on the mountain, so you might as well stay on the mountain. Sorry, babe. Okay, anybody know this guy? James Yates. He's a local bow hunter right here. Really nice guy. Very committed to fitness, very committed to hunting hard, backcountry hunter. I know James. He helped me get my buck this year. Not, he never set foot on the mountain with me. But he approached me after this seminar last year out in that hallway, knowing that I had inquired about the unit that I hunted. And he says, man, I have all the maps. I know everything about it. I know where the deer are. I know how to hunt them, how to approach it, blah, 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 blah. I get home. He sends me this email. That's, I didn't even read it all. I just couldn't believe all the stuff he told me. And I thought, why is this guy doing this? He's just a nice guy. He's a super nice guy. And he gave me all this information. And then... I think good things come to good people because he shared all that information with me. <clears throat> he hunted in the unit right next to where I was hunting and he killed this buck and it's incredible. And the story that he told me, sticking to the plan, that's what I call this section here. He stuck to the plan. James found the buck in mid-July. He scouted the buck for five weeks, two 10-mile round-trip hikes per week. He hunted it for six days and then one perfect arrow. The guy found what he wanted. He said, I know what I want. He found him in, I think he called that deer Triclops or something. And he found it in uh, July, stayed focused on it, didn't let the other deer will tempt you. Other things will tempt you to shoot him, like, oh man, like that three pointer, you know, that wide, immature three pointer. But his width got me, man. It was like it tempted me and I had to shoot him. And the fact that the other two guys didn't get him, I had to shoot him. So. That, that one right there, that's kind of becoming a trend. I'll tell you about my hunting story here in a minute. And that, that's kind of, kind of a trend for me. I like to shoot bucks other people miss. But the guy was absolutely committed to sticking to the plan. Anybody know this guy? Sean Morgan. You your friend? He's my friend. You know what? That guy's stud. He's young, and he's killed, I think, three or four. He just started bow hunting, like, in 2011. And he's killed, like, four bucks like that. Right here. What are we talking about? This guy doesn't live my life, I'll tell you that. He's not living the lifestyle I have because I have a lot more going on. But this guy's a young man, doesn't have a family yet, he's got a lot of time. That's the number one factor in killing mature deer. 
you got to have time to put in. you got to have time to spend doing it, right? But I'm not taking away from it because a guy does do the work. It takes work. It takes work with the time to get it done. The guy puts in the work, he puts in the time. This is an incredible story. This is an incredible story about this guy. Shot us out of the buck from July to, to the opener, which, so early July to August 15th, August 20th, somewhere in there. Hunted August 15th to the 28th. That's when he shot him. He shot the buck, I think, on the 28th of August. Even when other hunters sabotaged the hunt, he did not give up. Other hunter, he had spent all summer in this basin, no one around, watching the buck, figuring out the patterns. Hunted it, hunted it, hunted it, come, uh, come opening day or whatever. It seems like I remember seeing him talking about it. Other hunters tried to make a move on the buck, and it didn't work out. It blew the deer out. He didn't find him for a few days. That's going to happen. It's public land. He didn't even get mad about it. He's like, yeah, I'm kind of bummed that happened, but you know what? I'm just going to stick with it, and that's the buck I want, and I'm only going to shoot that buck. He did finally, on the 28th of August, get a shot at the deer, and he'll tell you flat out it was a less than perfect shot. But Sean is a conservationist like me and like most of you. If you put an arrow in a deer and you truly believe that's a lethal arrow, your hunt's over. You know, I'm not going to go keep hunting and keep putting arrows in other deer and risk crippling another one or another one. Bow hunting's a tough sport. It's really tough. So what Sean did is he said, for the rest of the season, I'm going to continue on like it's the hunt. I'm going to get up to my glassing spot. I'm going to continue to glass. I'm going to hunt the mornings. If I see that deer, I'm going to shoot it. If not, I'm going to go keep circling and looking where I lost last blood and all that stuff, right? Shot the deer on the 28th. This is incredible. On September the 7th, he found the deer, and it had just died. Now, that sounds bad, right? So if the anti-hunting crowd was in here, that would sound terrible. But we're all realists. We all have the same mindset. Hunting is hunting. You're going to put an arrow in a deer, and sometimes things aren't going to be absolutely perfect. I'm guilty right here many times because I only, pretty much only bow hunt. If you only bow hunt, you like to do it a lot, you're going to get a lot of shots. You get a lot of shots, your percentage of not having perfect shots are going to happen. Yeah. Sean made a less than perfect shot, but what he did was he said, I'm going to keep going there until I see the deer alive. I'm going to kill him, and if I don't, I'm going to keep hunting that deer, or maybe I'll find his carcass at least recover my rack. The deer had just died. I don't even think he lost the cape. Maybe he did. I don't know its mount. It's over there in Monarch. What's it called? Monarch Taxidermy, right? Monarch Mountain. Monarch Mountain Taxidermy, both of those bucks. James Yates' buck and Sean Morgan's bucks are there. I encourage you to go by and pay respect to those deer. Those deer represent hard work. They're awesome, nice, big bucks we all want. But when you look at those bucks, look at those racks, no, two great men put a lot of gave everything to get those things into this room for you to look at. So I think they deserve to be looked at like that. And those guys did not pay me to say that. So that's the kind of commitment we're talking about. Um, he was committed to one deer, he stuck with it. This is my deer from this year. Um, I'm gonna go through this pretty quick because you guys gotta have your time. I don't even know what, what time is my seminar over? It started at 5, 4.15, right? And it goes to when? 5.15? 5.30? I think it's 5.30. 7. We're staying till 7. Order some pizza, Chris! Okay. So I'm going to tell you the story. Sorry, I already set it up for you. I was going to come out. And this ain't just story time for Mark. I want you to learn something from this. Get something out of it. And I want you to ask questions once I get, when I start shutting my mouth and get a drink of water. Ask me questions that refer back to this. And it's all going to relate to our topic today. You know, I decided to kill a mature deer on this hunt after killing the crazy u horn deer. So, I got kind of baited into a tag. Guy said, hey man, let's go hunt this unit. Okay, we put in together, yeah, 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 I'm gonna put in. Well, I draw it. He's like, ah, oh, no, man, I got a second choice, which was the unit I really wanted. All right, well, you sucker, you got me on that one. So I'm stuck with a tag. Anybody know Tim Gillingham, pro staff manager over at Gold Tent? I see him at a 3D tournament in uh, Paris, Texas in the, in the spring. I'm like, hey Tim. How you doing, man? All good, Mark. How are you? I'm doing great. I said, he goes, hey, you coming out west this year? Hunting? I said, yeah, man. He goes, where are you going? Back up in the Wasatch? I said, yeah, man, but this year I'm going to four, five, six. Why? They hunt that with guns. In Tim fashion. That's just how Tim is. He's kind of gruff. Yeah, they're hunting that with, they hunt that with guns, you moron. Why would you hunt theirs? Well, you know, whoa, hey, bro. Is it good or is it not good? He's like, I would never hunt there. Man, a guy I, I respect says I would never hunt there. Man, I 
I got chipped on that deal. So, what the amazing thing is, people, people that know me from these seminars, word gets around, we all talk, hey, I drew a four, five, six. It's north of the highway up there, that's where I'm gonna go. And everybody says, why, they hunt that with guns. I thought you hunted in the other units. Well, I did. I got the bait and switch, man, I'm over here now. Well, amazing people reached out to me uh, through social media and said, hey, I understand you have that tag. It's a tough unit, it's a tough hunt, I wanna help you out. One of those guys sitting right here, David D. Austin. He helped me out, professional photographer, awesome guy. Thank you, man. Because without you, I wouldn't probably have that deer. I probably, I'm gonna went to Idaho and kill my 200 incher. But <laughs> hey, I got this, and man, I'm as proud of this buck as anything I've ever gotten. I truly, truly, I don't cry very often, especially when I'm hunting. I'm gonna tell you right now, right before this picture was taken, man, there were some tears, 15 days to get that buck killed. And that's nothing special. That's just an old deer. This is a four by three. But man, he meant everything to me. Everything to me. Guy reached out to me. He says, hey, I'm going to help you out. So come into town. David and Corey right here. They meet me in town. We'll grab a sandwich. I load up my pack. They hauled water. They hauled water in the tent. Sleeping bag. They hauled all kinds of stuff for me. <laughs> it's kind of a trend with these guys. They hauled it all up. We all went up, set me up at camp, and I stayed there 15 days. I went down like every third day, back to my truck, got more water, hauled it back up. There is no water on that mountain. I don't know what those animals are drinking. I couldn't even find a trickle out of the ground. <clears throat> so I get up there in a unit I've never set foot in. Some of these pictures may give it away, and people that hunt it regularly may hate me for it. I, good luck. Go ahead. Go hunt that. Do it. I might see you up there, I might not ever go again, ever. I have nightmares about it. But it was, it was awesome. So anyway, I get up there, I start taking inventory. And these aren't the best pictures because um, I didn't have a phone. You might got a phone scope? Yeah, well, I just discovered that in my life. Yeah, I went over today, man, I got mine. Phone scope is like, I don't, I don't have anything to do with phone scope. But if you're a guy that either likes to tell hunting stories or you just want to have cool pictures of bucks later, this is my high quality photos. <laughs> I hold my camera still as I could, watching the black come and go, come and go. Finally, I got a picture of deer. Terrible. Phone scope is awesome for taking pictures of bucks out in the mountains. So every morning, I'd get up, walk over on this ridge, and I'd glass back over to this ridge. Okay? So my camp is right here. And I hike all the way around here. I set up, and I glass this. Because if I set up on this side, I'd never see the deer. So I'd come around this side, glass back in there, find deer, put them to hard bed after 10 a.m., right? Imagine 15 days. I'm going to walk a mile over here, find them, take pictures, take pictures and take pictures, just so that I can go back and reference where the deer was at when I get back a mile to camp, another mile down, and I'm going to hike down and try to find these deer bedded. Because if I try, I tried setting up here, I can't find them. I had to come over here every time, glass over there. But this is where all the bucks like to be right here. But these are the kind of bucks I were seeing for the most part. I did find one big mature buck, um, and it's not this buck. This is a nice four-point uh, four buck that Corey and I glassed up together. He came up on the Monday after the opener. I, or, uh, yeah, I hunted three a couple of days, and then Corey came, and then... Uh, he encouraged me. I think he wanted to see a bloody arrow. Man, please go shoot that buck. I'm like, that's just not, that's a Pope and Young four point buck. That's 145 inch, you know, class four point buck. And he was taking pictures of that just through his camera on a, was that a phone scope? Or just a, yeah, you just take it through swarm. Yeah. So he was taking pictures, and that's just across the canyon from us. And I don't know, you know, a lot of people will tell you this deer was a quarter of a mile away and they passed it. It was a quarter mile away. Did you stalk it? No. Well, then you didn't really pass it. What you're saying is you just were too lazy to walk over there and try to shoot it. So a lot of people say, yeah, I passed up 145 inch or Pope and Young. I didn't really want him. I kind of wanted him. I just really didn't want to walk over there. It had a marginal 50-50 chance. I felt it was 50-50. I think if the odds tipped in my favor as 1%, I'd have killed the deer. But there was a good chance where the wind was blowing, if I remember right. That's why I backed out of it.